Moving on to the next module of the agenda, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Sangeet Paul Chaudhary as our next industry keynote speaker. Sangeet is an industry analyst, founder and CEO of Platform Thinking Labs, and will be presenting on the topic of the changing geometry of business. Sangeet is a leading keynote speaker at global events and conferences, as well as a best-selling author. He is ranked as one of the top 30 management thinkers globally. He speaks on various topics related to business platforms, models, and key trends driving various global businesses. Allow me to welcome him on stage, please. Good morning. It's a pleasure being here this morning. And as we talk about digital innovation and the overall idea of digital transformation, what I want to do over the next few minutes is weave a narrative around how to think about digital transformation from the perspective of a shift in business model design. Because the real impact that digital is, ha is having on business today is it's fundamentally changing the design of business models as they are. And when we think about digital innovation, there are two contrasting narratives that come to mind uh, when we think about it. There's the narrative of the startups and the digital natives that have come up over the last few years with a certain kind of business design that they've never had in the past. What we see about a range of these startups that have come up over the last five years in particular is that we're seeing a range of startups where the business does not own any assets of itself, the business doesn't seem to be controlling anything, and yet it seems to be creating and capturing a lot of value. And this quote from uh, TechCrunch uh, from last year exemplifies this very well, where it talks about almost facetiously about the fact that the largest taxi company today does not own any taxis, the largest media company doesn't own any content, and so on. And very often we tend to think of these emerging business models as just being asset light, as being resource light, and quite often as having really crazy inappropriate valuations. But what I want to talk about today is take those aspects of the business away from what we see in these business models and try to see what's really changing about these business models that can be applied to incumbents as well. So that's one side of how digital innovation is happening with companies that we would think of as truly digital natives, and especially companies that have come up over the last five to 10 years in particular. On the other side, we have a range of companies that are incumbents that have been around for 50 to 100 years and that have suddenly started working in really strange ways that almost seem to be going into businesses that do not make any sense for them. So we have an example of a coffee company that today is trying to be a payments company that has the potential, given the right regulations, to potentially compete with Visa and MasterCard someday. We have a pharmacy, a, a retailer like Walgreens, that today is extending to become a multi-services healthcare company. We have a traditional industrial company like John Deere, which has been in the simple business of manufacturing tra tractors and selling tractors. And that is today turning into a software company with uh, their My John Deere platform, which is an, a central software, a central platform for combining all agricultural activities in one place and promising outcomes on the basis of that. So fundamentally, the business is moving from selling tractors to guaranteeing agricultural outcomes, which is a significant shift in how the business used to work. And probably one of the most baffling examples of what I would think of as digital innovation or transformation is this Fortune 1000 company called McCormick Foods, which has been in a fairly simple and commodified business of selling herbs and spices. So it's always been in the business of selling spices, and today it's hiring data scientists. And that's because it's coming up with this new initiative where it's trying to quantify the data profile of every single user of, of the kind of foods that they like to taste, and potentially use that data profile as an industry standard to match people with the right food. So just like Facebook has a personalized news feed, they're trying to potentially build a personalized food uh, consumption mechanism of the future, and that's where a company that's always been in the business of selling merely herbs and spices is today moving on to hire data scientists and become a data company. Clearly, what we're seeing today is that the world is changing, and it's not just a new set of technologies which are making what already exists more efficient. It's a change where you actually need a new set of maps, a totally new set of mental models to think about how this change is happening today. And very often, when we think of digital, we tend to think of it as 
the shift from offline to online or the shift from physical to digital, a lot of companies, when I talk to them, they talk about digital transformation and essentially what they're doing is they're shifting things from offline to online or physical to digital. And we've talked about this since the morning. It's not a shift sim as simple as that. It's not just taking the business model that you had offline and pasting it online. It's not about saying that we used to have uh, the tail channel offline and now we have the tail channel online. That's not really digital transformation. If anything, it's digital copy and paste. You're just copying what used to work, pasting it somewhere else and hoping it'll work again over there. But you're not really realizing the key value of what happens when A, the world becomes connected, allowing everything to be connected centrally. B, systems become more intelligent because of the data that you can capture. And C, because of both of these things, you have the ability to orchestrate partners and customers together to in, in order to interact with each other directly. And with that in mind, the key shift that I believe today is happening is a shift in business models from what I think of as pipes to what we've been calling platforms for quite some time. And what I think of when I think of digital transformation is a fundamental business model redesign. So let's talk about what I call pipes first. Traditionally, business has always worked in the form of a pipe. You create something, you package it, you push it out to a customer who's sitting at the other end of the pipe, and the customer pays you money and your business is done. Business used to be very simple, it used to be very linear, it used to work in the straight line from one end to the other. What happened when the internet first came about was that the initial business models ended up being extremely efficient pipes. They did not change the fundamental business model design. What we saw initially, what we thought of as disruption, 10 years back with essentially a really efficient pipe eating an inefficient one. So newspapers were an inefficient pipe. If you had to transfer news, you had to bear the cost of transporting physical paper. And online news disrupted that by creating a highly efficient pipe where news could be transferred globally at nearly zero marginal cost of distribution. Amazon eating borders, Netflix eating Blockbuster were initially, again, examples of a highly efficient pipe eating a highly inefficient one. And so what we saw initially when we talked about, when we thought of digital transformation or digital disruption in say 10 to 15 years back was essentially just an efficient pipe eating an inefficient one. But what's happened over the last 10 years and especially over the last five years is that we've seen a fundamentally new design to business models emerging over this time. And that's what I think of as platforms. Essentially, when you look at the structure of a pipe, what we had over there was a cross-section, a, a linear section of the business where you cut, the, cut through the business and you see how f the materials and money flows through the business. It works like a pipe. If you cut through a platform business, what you see is a fundamentally different shape, and that's why I call this the changing geometry of business. When we think of the word platform, very often what comes to mind is something that we have in our pocket, something that we associate with as the Android platform or the iOS platform, and what happens when we look at this is that when we cut this business, when we cut through this business, we see a fundamentally different design where Apple or Android merely act as an infrastructure for external providers and external producers to come on board, create value on top of the platform, and allow external users to come and interact directly with the, these external producers. And this is something that's not just restricted to technology platforms. If we take this further, if you look at what's happening with Airbnb, Airbnb works in a very similar manner where, the, where it acts as the infrastructure and creates a market on top of it. The goal over here being that you provide the infrastructure on which others can plug in, and then you set the rules of play for that market. So it's a plug and play business model where you invite others to plug in and you govern the interactions that ensue. If you look at YouTube, it again works in a very similar model. Of course, what's changing over here is that we're not necessarily talking about two highly distinct markets, we're talking about two distinct roles. And if you look at Amazon, again, it changed the way the publishing industry worked by providing a platform where writers could connect directly with readers. So what we see across all of this is that the fundamental design of business is changing because of digital. And the new design of business essentially in involves the platform being the infrastructure on which external producers can come in, create value, and interact directly with external consumers. There are two things that are important when you think about this platform business model. And if you keep just those two things in mind, it starts making a lot of sense in terms of the strategies that non-platform incumbents have been pursuing of late. The first thing is that if you want to get the consumers on board, you need to 
attract data about the consumers. So you need to st stop being just a company that sells, and you need to start being a company that starts acquiring data. You need to stop being just a company that measures dollars coming in, and you need to start being a company that measures data coming in. That's the first thing that all of these platform companies do. The second thing that they do is they attract an ecosystem of external producers around themselves. And those, that ecosystem of external producers comes in either because you have unique data about your consumers, which is what is in a way happening with Walgreens right now, where it's attracting data, where, where it's capturing data about medi medicine consumption and then connecting those patients with other telehealth providers. Or you need to be in a place where external participants would automatically want to work with you and then create a new bundled product from the ecosystem, a new set of bundled value that consumers would value more. And so essentially, this idea of absorbing data and building an ecosystem around this absorbed data is essentially the difference between what we used to work as when we used to, be, when, when we used to think in terms of pipes and how we need to work when we start thinking in terms of platforms. When we think of this shift from pipes to platforms, the first change that we see over here, and that is most evident with uh, the digital platform, native platform companies, is that the, the, the fundamental shift that's happening is you're no longer competing on the basis of resources, you're competing on the basis of ecosystems. Traditionally, if you had to compete, you had to have access to an inimitable resource, a resource that could not be imitated by your competitors. What's important today is that you need to capture an ecosystem that cannot be imitated by your competitors. And once you have that ecosystem, once you build a network of these pr producers around yourself, and you create the, create the right incentives to prevent them from shifting to somebody else, you have a unique competitive advantage that could not be captured purely through ownership of resources in the past. The second thing that's happening is that when you think of pipes, a, the business of a pipe is essentially the creation of a process of value creation end-to-end -end and the repeatability and increasing the efficiency of this process on an ongoing basis. So if you're a manufacturing company, you have this end-to-end -end manufacturing process and all the time you're focused on how you make this process more efficient and more repeatable. The fundamental difference that happens when you think of a platform is that instead of having an internal process, you have to focus on an ecosystem interaction and figure out how do you make that ecosystem interaction more and more efficient and repeatable over time. So if you think of an Uber or an Airbnb, what it looks at is what is that interaction that we need to enable between a driver and a traveler or between a host and a guest? And how can we make that interaction more and more efficient over time, more and more repeatable over time? without actually entering and trying to be the person who participates in the interaction. And that's the fundamental difference that happens when we move from the traditional pipe model to the platform model. As a result, all the managerial decisions that we take when we're running a pipe have always been process first. You always think about the process. What helps the process become more efficient? What we need to look at now is what helps this interaction become more efficient. What are occasions when the interaction can fail? As an example, if you're the user of Uber and if you open the app, Uber application and you see no taxi available, that's a case of interaction failure. There was a reason, there was a demand being generated, but there was no supply to meet that demand. And if that happens a couple of times, you're probably going to shift to a competitor. And so that's a, a, a situation where the, your competitive advantage of owning that ecosystem is going to go away from you. So if you track interaction failure and success the way you used to track process failure and success, that's essentially the significant shift that needs to come in when you move from a pipe to a platform model. In summary, when, when we think of the platform model, what it essentially is, is it's an infrastructure that is enabling interactions. What's most important is to figure out what is the interaction that we want to enable. And this is where this is different fundamentally from a lot of technology-related businesses that we've looked at in the past, where we've tried to focus heavily on the infrastructure when that infrastructure has been used to move the sources that we manage. So if you were running an SAP or an Oracle or any of these things, you were essentially using an infrastructure to manage an internal process. And that's where the design of the infrastructure also fundamentally was different, because you did not need to drive adoption around people who may not want to be part of the infrastructure. But when you're building a platform, you need to drive adoption of the platform am among ecosystem partners. So designing the infrastructure is very much just the first simple step over here. What's more important after that is structuring the right incentives 
creating the ecosystem design around it, which will make these partners want to come back repeatedly onto your platform. And on the whole, the goal of the platform on an ongoing basis is to scale the quality and the quantity of interactions. There, has been many, there have been many cases where a platform has been extremely successful in scaling quantity of interactions and has failed terribly in scaling quality of interactions. We're seeing that to some extent with all the complaints about Uber today uh, in this day and age. But in the past, we've seen that with companies like MySpace, which, have wor which worked really well to become dominant platforms. And at the end of it, failed because the quality of interactions on the platform was failing and there was a better alternative that they could move to. So if we think of this shift from platform pipe business models to platform business models, we see this shift happening repeatedly across industries because, as I mentioned, there are three things that are happening today. One is that the world is getting more networked, two, systems are getting more intelligent, and three, because of this, you have the ability to get and aggregate an ecosystem around yourself and allow them to interact with each other. This shift of these three symptoms is being repeated across industry. It's not just happening in a corner. It's, it probably was happening in a corner 10 years back, but we're increasingly seeing this shift happening across industries. As an example, one of the first industries that got affected by this was when uh, the, hand, the traditional handset manufacturers used to work like a pipe. And recently, the CEO of Nokia uh, remarked in an interview saying that we did right things and yet we failed. And that's because they kept on trying to get their pipe even better. They kept on trying to improve their processes even better. They kept on trying to compete by creating better products, doing better sourcing of applications. And what fundamentally changed was not simply the touchscreen of the iPhone or, or the better product from Apple, but actually the fact that they had this app store which allowed any phone to become an extendable machine in, in any direction. They allowed the complete personalization of the phone because of the ecosystem of developer partners that they had around their platform. A second example that is playing out live right now, and when I talk to leaders at hotels, they have this thing working on their minds all the time. Six years back, Marriott, Sheraton, Intercontinental, none of these people thought about Airbnb, cared about Airbnb. It seemed like a hipster uh, connection website which was used by a bunch of uh, backpackers around the world. And today, all of them are worried about Airbnb because what's happening is Airbnb is using an ecosystem to fight the resources of these hotels. It does not need to build resources of its own. It's strengthening its ecosystem on an ongoing basis. And what's happening with Airbnb, if you have a look at it, is first it built out the quantity of interactions. It created a huge ecosystem. Then using a rating system, it started improving the quality of interactions. And over time, the improved quality allowed it to move further upstream and directly start competing with the likes of Marriott because it had the ability to guarantee a comparable stay because of the superior quality tracking mechanisms that it had. We've seen this again with Amazon, with how it's changed the way publishing works from a point where traditional publishing worked in a highly gate-kept fashion to a point where now anybody who wants to publish a book can come onto Amazon and find a, a readership potentially. So what we see across all of these shifts is that there are five things that are repeated whenever an industry moves from pipes to platform business models. The first thing, without a doubt, is the fact that there should be some form of digitization. So because of that, media and telecom were the first industries to be disrupted. And because digitization did not hit manufacturing or heavy industry till very recently, they have not been disrupted in the same big way or they have not had to innovate in the same big way. But with the rise of things like the Internet of Things and CD printing, we're seeing digitization coming into all kinds, all, all industries today. With the rise of mobility, we're seeing digitization hit any industry that is out there in the physical world that wasn't considered to be online in the traditional sense. So what we see repeatedly is that when digitization hits an industry, there are five things that happen to that industry, or there could be one or more of these five things that happen to the industry. The first thing is that if an industry relies on inefficient gatekeepers, digitization leads to the rise of platforms that remove these gate this gatekeeping. A classic example is the publishing industry. And when Amazon came in and allowed authors to directly reach audiences, that was a case when a platform started beating the traditional pipe model. We're seeing this happen very significantly in healthcare today, where traditional healthcare institutions have been the gatekeepers of patient data. What's happening today is we're seeing at least four different kinds of companies coming in from four different sites, trying to get access to that same patient data. 
We're seeing the likes of Apple and Google trying to come in and uh, Jawbone and other variable companies like Philips coming in from one side trying to get access to this data. On the other side, we're, trying to see, uh, we're starting to see companies like Walgreens coming in saying that we've got access to some patient data, what if we got more of this? On a third side, we have the traditional pharmaceutical companies saying that if, if we need to provide end-to-end -end patient care, we need to create an ecosystem of medicines, not just the medicines we provide. So they're trying to get access to patient data. And we have the traditional gatekeepers of the healthcare companies themselves trying to get this data. So what, what we're seeing over here is that a comp a, an industry that used to have a very inefficient gatekeeper, the gatekeeper is now facing significant competition from all sides. We've seen this happen in, in, a, in a big way in media in the past. We're seeing it in healthcare and banking today. Another thing that we see when platforms come into an industry is that platforms unlock new sources of value. Very often, platforms aggregate an existing ecosystem. But a few times, and this is especially when platforms become really powerful, they actually create a new ecosystem out of nowhere. 10 years back, they, people, this whole inventory of available rooms was not possible because Airbnb was not there. That spare capacity already existed, but it was not digitized and available on an open market. And that's what Airbnb did. It ended up creating this whole new ecosystem of rooms around itself. Another, a third thing that platforms do is that they aggregate fragmented and inefficient markets. Whenever you have a market which has very low visibility, which has very low transparency, a platform comes in and takes data about that market and creates trans transparency in that market. A good example of that is Yelp or TripAdvisor, which is essentially taking a lot of data from users and using that data to provide some quality score for the various participants in that market. So Yelp provides a quality score for restaurants, TripAdvisor provides a quality score for hotels, for example. And we're starting to see something like this happening in B2B supplier markets as well, where B2B companies that are, are using some form of invoicing uh, SaaS application, the application starts capturing all of this data about who's paying in time, who's delivering goods on time, and on the basis of that starts creating this light layer of reputation and quality around the companies that participate in that market. So this is, again, a common narrative that we see in disruption. A fourth thing that we see is that platforms enable entirely new models of production. So if you think of how Encyclopedia Britannica was written, it was written in a very pipe-like fashion. You had people coming in uh, to, an to a company, you had, th you had them deciding what to write about, and then they would create this whole set of encyclopedias which would fill up one wall of your dining room. And what Wikipedia did was it took the supply chain, digitized every action in the supply chain, unpeeled it, and then reassembled it onto a platform which created this ongoing living encyclopedia that people could come in, change any time, and keep on benefiting from on an ongoing basis. And a fifth way in which platforms change different industries is that they make industry boundaries extremely porous. This is what we saw in, in the beginning when I talked about Starbucks becoming a payments company or uh, Walgreens becoming a full services healthcare company. What happens when platforms come in is that your traditional competitor is no longer the only one you need to, be, to worry about. Traditionally, you would worry about the person who owns the same resources that you own, and you would try to own better resources than, than them. What happens with platform competition is that you need to start worrying about anybody else who, ha who has access or the ability to capture the same data that you would like to capture about your consumers. And once you start worrying about them, them the, the, the boundaries of who you're competing with or who's in your industry completely change. Anybody from a, a parallel industry, from a totally unrelated industry, could be capturing data about your consumer, which could give them the ability to move in your direction in the future. And that's one of the uh, most interesting implications of what happens when a platform starts hitting a certain industry. So those are five things, five ways in which platforms are changing industries today. And if you see any of those symptoms in your industry, that's an example of a case where a platform might be poised to enter and start changing things within that industry. Another thing that, that's really interesting about platforms is that the things that drive platforms, the things that lead to success for platforms is fundamentally different from the things that lead to success for pipes. Pipes succeed because they focus heavily on efficiency and heavily on improving the end-to-end -end business process. Platforms succeed because of five different reasons. And very often when we think of platform scale, these are the kinds of 
images that come to mind where you see user growth and revenue growth skyrocketing in what is now called exponential order. The main point is whether it's exponential or not, it's not the same linear step-by-step -step growth in, that we used to see in the past. Usually what happens in these cases is there's an inflection point after which growth increases really rapidly. And there are five reasons why this form of non-linear growth happens. The first thing is that what platforms do is that they scale at zero marginal costs of expansion. And that's, that's best exemplified in this tweet by Brian Chesky, where he says that if Marriott has to scale, it has to add more rooms. But if we have to scale, we just have to increase ecosystem partners. And this applies not just to uh, true blue platforms who are digital natives, but any pipe organization, traditional incumbent that's moving to become a platform, they also can apply the same principles to create an ecosystem around themselves and start scaling in a similar manner at zero marginal costs of scaling. The second thing that becomes really important when you're thinking about platforms is that platforms benefit from network effects. What that means is that as more and more people start using the platform, the value of the platform for every individual participant increases. A classic way of understanding network effects is the idea of the telephone. Uh, there's this joke that the, the, the guy who sold the first telephone must have been the world's best salesman because the value of the first telephone is zero. But once you start having many people using telephones, the value increases non-linearly. This is a good way to understand network effects, but what's more important in the age of the internet is that the internet does not simply connect people like the telephone used to. In addition to that, it also allows some people to create value and others to consume that value. So it allows the creation of this persistent value. And what happens in that case is that the moment you start gathering an ecosystem around yourself, as more and more value creators come on board, more consumers start finding more value, and as more value consumers start coming on board, that becomes even more exciting for more value creators to come on board. And this network effect, this two-sided pull that keeps bringing the producers and the consumers together is what helps the platform scale once it reaches a certain point. A third thing that's really important with platforms is that platforms invest in creating entirely new behaviors and in making that behavior highly addictive. So if you think of uh, MySpace, MySpace or Friendster or anything that used to be a social network in the past, these places used to be a place where you would go when you wanted to talk to somebody. So if you had an active need of interacting with somebody, you would go to a MySpace. Today you go to Facebook irrespective of whether you want to talk to somebody. You go to Facebook to check what's happening because of the news feed. And essentially what Facebook has succeeded in doing is it's created an entirely new behavior. So even though MySpace and Facebook seem similar in terms of product design, they are fundamentally different because of this new behavior that's been created. And thinking of Facebook, a fourth thing that makes platforms really powerful is that they learn about the users that are using them and become more and more personalized over time. This is what's happening with Facebook today. I see this happening with uh, what I mentioned with in the case of McCormick Foods and potentially the food industry. And there's increasingly a, a drive towards personalized medicine, personalized insurance, all kinds of personalization where the business will start gathering data and start strengthening the filter through which it serves value to the user. And the final thing that makes platform scale really fast is a concept called virality. Very often we confuse this term and conflate it and think of this as being the same as word of mouth. But virality is fundamentally different from word of mouth and it's important to understand this because that is what helps most platforms scale really fast today. Word of mouth is what happens when people like your product so much that they want to talk about it all the time. So for word of mouth to happen, you need people to really love your product and you need them to go and talk about it without you being able to control or track that process in any way. What virality does is fundamentally different. It bakes the idea of spread within the usage of the product. So if you think of Instagram, the core purpose of Instagram was not just to take a photo, but once you've taken the photo, it encouraged you to share that photo on Facebook as part of that creation flow. And that is what virality is. You don't need to like Instagram to spread Instagram. You just need to use Instagram in order to sp spread Instagram. And that's fundamentally where platforms do not have to rely on word of mouth. They have to create this kind of network spread within the usage of the platform itself. And that's what makes them scale really fast. So it's a combination of these five factors. And very often when I w advise companies on this, what we look at is how are we ranking on these five things and how, how is the business model able to leverage these five things in particular so that the platform can benefit from nonlinear scale. 
So with that in mind, let's talk briefly about what it takes to build platforms. And especially over here, I want to take, uh, I, I want to focus more on incumbent organizations and uh, think about peeling out these two aspects. The, the fact that we need to start becoming data acquiring companies, data absorbing companies, where we get more data about our end consumers. And secondly, we need to think about building ecosystems. So when we think about the idea of building platforms, the first thing that I want to stress on is that you can no longer afford to start with technology. Because in the past, when you built technology, that technology was supposed to improve processes, enable management of resources. It was essentially, the usage of the technology was essentially much more controlled than it is today. Today, when you're building an ecosystem, you need to build the right incentives around the technology. And to do that, you need to start by designing the interaction. You need to understand who's going to be the ecosystem partner that's coming on board your platform. What, who's the end consumer that's going to come over here? What kind of data about that consumer is going to be really valuable and is going to be difficult to imitate? And who in your ecosystem is going to value that kind of data about the consumer? Once we have answers to these questions, we have an interaction designed end to end, and that's when it becomes effective to start designing the technology that will enable this interaction. Once this is done, there needs to be a growth strategy along the five levers that I mentioned of platform scale, which allows this interaction to scale on an ongoing basis to create this cross-sided network effects. So a, a simple way of thinking about this is what I think of as the platform stack, which is to say that every platform business has three fundamental layers. And we need to figure out how we want to operate on all these three layers if we are a traditional pipe business and we want to move in the direction of a platform. The three layers that I think of is that every platform business has an ecosystem layer or a network layer. And the reason I prefer using the word network is to emphasize that the, they have to be constantly and fundamentally connected to your business. We've always had this concept of the value web or value network uh, where the business has been connected but not digitally. But what happens with platforms is that your ecosystem is constantly connected to you constantly sourcing uh, uh, data and information from you and constantly adding value back to the platform. So the first thing is this constant connected, constantly connected network that needs to be created around the platform. The second thing is that you need to have an infrastructure which provides this plug and play mechanism. And in addition to the infrastructure, the additional thing that you need is you need to have rules of governance for governing this external ecosystem. What is allowed? What is open to an external partner? What is closed from an external partner? Where can competitors come in? Where can non-competing partners come in? These are all the questions that need to be answered when you're going down the, the road of building platforms. And finally, the third part of the stack is to actually know that fundamentally the real value that you have is the data that you have about the ecosystem and about the interactions that ensue in this ecosystem. And so these three things are the fundamental three building blocks of a platform business model. And depending on what kind of company you are, you might start at a different place from all, with all of these three things. If you, if you are, are a company that has direct access to the consumer, say you're the retailer or, or you're a bank, you might want to start at the data layer because that direct access to the consumer provides you with a unique ability to start capturing data right away. If you're the company that has been in the business of integrating the value chain in the past, you could potentially start at the network layer by bringing ecosystem partners together and create kind of offering out that goes out to the consumers and then moving in that direction. So depending on what your traditional business has been, what kinds of assets you already have, you have different op opportunities and options to start executing on this platform stack. But what's important over here is that in all of these things, there are certain things to keep in mind. First, when you're thinking about the network, it's important to ensure that your digital strategy is not built around websites and apps. It's actually built around the interactions that you're enabling between your partners and your consumers. So the interaction first approach should be core to your digital strategy. The second thing that I mentioned earlier is that you need to start investing in behavior design. And this involves two things. If you're, building e if you're bringing ecosystem partners on board, behavior design might mean providing them with analytics, providing them with learning about how to better participate in the ecosystem, making them better at doing their own business rather than giving them the impression that you're taking business away from them. That would be behavior design for uh, an ecosystem partner. For a consumer, a behavior design may simply be something as simple as personalization, making your services and your, your offerings to the consumer highly personalized. Going on to the infrastructure layer, when we design the platform, 
we need to start focusing on this interaction and on this value exchange. What is this value exchange? What are producers creating on the platform? How are consumers discovering it? What kind of decision support systems do these consumers need to discover this, uh, this value that is created on the platform? And that's, those are the kinds of questions that should go into the architecture of the platform as a whole. The second thing that's important when you're building the infrastructure is to build these rules of market governance, the ecosystem governance. There should be rules baked into the system that track the behavior of ecosystem partners and of users and keep nudging them in the right direction because you can't follow a command and control model over here. It's an ecosystem of loosely connected partners. And what you need is you need to bake these rules into the system that track behavior and on the basis of that nudge these partners and users in the right direction. Finally, coming to data, and this is where I see the biggest shift that's required, is fundamentally we've been in the business of acquiring dollars. All we've done, all the systems we've built have been about dollar acquisition. So all the accounting systems that we've built, they just measure the amount of dollars captured. What we need to move to when we're building platforms is focus on dollar capture, but also focus on data capture. And that, that might mean things like focusing on accounting for data. Where are we capturing data in our organization? What is the monetizable value of that data? How much money are we spending to capture that data today? All of those questions need to come, in, come into place when we're thinking about becoming a data-first organization. And as I mentioned, when, when it comes to platforms, you're either you're, you're doing two things together. You're getting a lot of data, and you're bringing an ecosystem together. And technology is just helping you do that. So unless you create these best practices for data internally, it's not going to happen of its own. And that is when you need to think about the next step as well. Once this data comes in, how do I use this data to create entirely new business models? If I was selling herbs and spices till yesterday, what can I start doing now that I have data about the kind of tastes that consumers have? Can I connect them to other kinds of third parties? Can I use this as a standard for Nestle to start uh, branding and personalizing its products tomorrow? All of those kinds of questions start coming in about new data-driven business models. And finally, What's very important for when, when building platforms is to start thinking of using data as an integration layer. The easiest way to fail as a platform is to do a really good digital project in one corner of the organization and have the rest of the organization still working like a pipe. And that is where it's really important to integrate all aspects of your business, all customer touch points, all partner touch points onto a single data layer. We've, of course, seen this with Nike where they've been in the business of shoes, selling shoes, and today what we're seeing is that they, they've got shoes that are connected to the internet that are talking to their apps, and these apps are talking to other variables that are there, and potentially all of this data helps them connect users with each other, connect users with third parties, and this data acquisition and data integration becomes the starting point for creating an entire ecosystem in the future. With increasingly, we've seen this in the past with Apple, where the ownership of Apple products increases as you own more Apple products because of this integration. And we're increasingly seeing this in heavy industry where we're seeing the likes of GE connecting all of their machines with a common data layer that not only helps them improve turnaround time on, on disaster management or in, in terms of tracking analytics about how these machines are performing, but also gives them the ability to go into new kinds of businesses because of the data that they're acquiring. So if we bring all of this together, in all of my work working with companies, helping them move from a pipe business model to platform business model, and helping them think about this transformation, I've essentially seen two common approaches in which companies move in this direction. Because it's one thing to say that Uber is doing this, Airbnb is doing this. It's another thing to go, to your, uh, uh, go, go internally in, in your company and say that we're an airline and we want to build the Uber for airlines. And we don't know what it looks like, but Uber is a good idea. So, What's important when you're doing this whole platform thing is to have a key idea of what the end goal should be, but to have an initial roadmap that, is, that can be validated even without the whole platform being created and being implemented. So the way I usually think about going down this platform transformation is to figure out how can you move from being a pipe to being a data gathering pipe to being something that creates an ecosystem around it to finally building out the entire platform. So if you think of this again in terms of the stack that I mentioned, the network infrastructure and data layers, there are typically two ways in which, platform, which companies move in the direction of platforms. The first is the CMO-led approach, where the marketing organization or the, or 
the so-called innovation organization comes in and says that we want to do this project, this small initiative as an experiment that captures a new kind of data about users or that it targets a new kinds, kind of users that we would not have targeted using our traditional channels. And from there, we have this idea of going down the whole platform route. The reason the first step gets funded is because there's a clear business case of we're going after this new customer with new data, or we're going after an existing customer, getting more data and increasing the lifetime value of that customer. I'll get to a few examples over here, but that's usually one starting point. Classic cases where companies do this is are companies which have access to the end customer, either retailers, bankers, or even companies that have not traditionally had access to the end customer, but can potentially have it, for example, FMCG companies. The other case in which this transformation works is when this, when this becomes CIO-led, where the CIO comes in and says that we need to integrate everything before we do anything, and that integration is going to help us save money. So data-driven business models far out in the future, but saving money because of data layer integration is possibly something that can be done over the next few months to the next one year or so. And that becomes the first justification point to say that if we can get this thing going, we are going to start realizing benefits right away and potentially in the future move in the direction of a platform. So typically what I see is either companies moving in the CMO-led model or the CIO-led model. I've never seen a successful platform emerge within a company by saying we want to build a platform that will work only once it has millions of users. And so what essentially happens is once you start with the CMO-led model or a CIO-led model, you eventually need to start moving to other aspects of the stack and own the whole stack. So the first case, the CMO-led model, is what I think of as experiments. Typically, this may take the case of many different experiments. A, a company might say we want to launch five or six different digital initiatives that capture data about the user and help us explore new directions. The other example, the CIO-led model, is what I think of as an efficiency model, where the goal is to create efficiency and to sell that internally in the quest towards becoming a platform. But what's really important when you're becoming a platform is to move from experiment and efficiency, wherever you start, to evolution. And that is fundamentally where digital transformation happens. Because till that point, what you've been doing is simply improving a pipe. At this point, when you move and cover all layers of the stack, that is when you're moving to becoming a complete platform business model. And the, the way these two things work is there are some companies that go down the experiment to evolution path. So a great example is Nike. Six years back, Nike was doing a lot of different digital experiments. And one fine day, they realized that it did not make sense for all of these digital experiments to work on their own. They had to be greater value experienced if all of these could be integrated. So they first started with the experiments at the network layer, and then they integrated it at the data layer. And that's how they moved to the, to the, in the direction of a platform. Another example of this is the retailer Burberry. Burberry was doing a lot of uh, digital experiments of itself, and what it realized pretty soon was that unless they had a unique identifier of the user across all of these digital touch points, and unless they could track the user across all these touch points and create a unified experience, there was no value in doing all of, there was very little value in doing all of these different experiments. And once you have that unique identifier of the user and you can track everything that they've done with you, you have a unique access to data that your ecosystem partners may start valuing as well. So Nike and Burberry are two classic examples, uh, two well-known examples of companies that have gone down the experiment path, started on the experiment path, moved on to evolution. On the other hand, we have certain companies that have started on the efficiency path and moved on to evolution. What's happening right now in the car industry, for example, we have uh, companies like uh, Volvo, Toyota, Ford, all of them realize that the car is the next smartphone, and that's where things are going to start changing. And so the first step that they're taking in this direction is to improve the outcome of their existing business by having a car that starts acquiring and absorbing data. Once they get all of this data in, there's a whole host of business models, whether it's improving uh, driver accuracy, whether it's connecting drivers to um, uh, insurance companies and providing personalized insurance, there's a whole host of business models that emerge from there. But the first thing that helped them move in this direction was if we could create a car that constantly acquires data, we're going to have a business case internally for improving our existing pipe. And finally, you have another example of a casino in the US, Caesars Entertainment. Essentially, what it did was it provided personalization at scale by starting to absorb data. 
Typically what casinos do is that they consider a specific segment of their customers who they call whales who end up spending a lot of money at the casinos and they track their behavior heavily and try to personalize the experience of these whales heavily. What Caesars Entertainment did was it digitized the whole casino experience and in fact the whole Vegas experience so that it could track what users were doing across their whole time period over there. And on the basis of that, the unique advantages that it could offer to whales, it could now start offering to all users because the data allowed them to scale that, that process. So essentially, they started with this, uh, with this model of acquire data, make what we do more scalable and more efficient, and now they're moving in the direction of making this a multi-stakeholder platform as well. So those are the ways in which we see pipes moving to platforms regularly in different industries. And across all of these things, what, what really helps is to understand that you need to execute at all three layers of the stack. You need to execute not just at infrastructure, but at governing and creating the community, and also at absorbing, acquiring, and managing the data that you acquired. And I speak about this in a lot of detail in my upcoming book that comes out in a couple of weeks, Platform Revolution, uh, looking at all aspects of what it takes to build and manage a platform. But at the end of it, what I would like to leave you with, if there's one message, it's this, that we do not, we, we've always thought of this move as being, as we need to move from physical to digital. But the move that we essentially need to make is not just simply taking what used to work in the physical and applying it to the digital. The move that we need to make based on what I shared through today is actually a move from pipes to platforms. We need to fundamentally think of a current business model think of it as a process and try to reimagine what kind of interactions can be built around this process. How can we leverage our existing assets to start acquiring data? How can we use that data to, to bring an ecosystem around, around ourselves? And then how can we, in the future, compete on the basis of those ecosystems? So that's the message I want to leave you with this morning. Thank you so much for listening. It's been a real pleasure speaking here. And if you'd like to have any questions, I'm happy to take those. Thank you. Any questions, I'm happy to take that. Okay, in that case, I'll be on the, on the sidelines and I'd be happy to take any questions directly if you have them. Thank you.